Well hello there year sixes and welcome to chapter 14 of Anthony Horowitz's Stormbreaker. Um, I hope you really enjoyed the book so far. I know I've got to, uh, I'm lucky with chapter 14, it's quite an exciting chapter. Um, so I'll quickly introduce myself and then I will get on with the story. So my name's Mrs Julie, I'm head of year 11 at Ormiston. Um, I've been there a long time, uh, so if I think if you've had brothers or sisters or perhaps cousins that uh, have been to Ormiston um, previously, they will probably uh, they'll probably remember me. Um, as head of year eleven, and you're coming into year seven, you may think that Tim, you might not have much to do with me, but I do hope that that's wrong. Um, I love to sort of be around the academy and um, share duties with the rest or rest of the pastoral department. Um, so I should see lots of your lovely faces in September. You will sometimes find me in the science department as well because I like to help them out do some science teaching. Um, so I think that's about all to share with me. Um, I hope you're going to pay attention as I'm reading because I've got some questions for you at the end. And without further ado, I'll make a start. Chapter 14, Deep Water. Alex gave up trying to break free of the chair. His wrists were bruised and bloody where the chain cut into him, but the cuffs were too tight. After 30 minutes when Mr Grin still hadn't come back, Alex had tried to reach the zit cream that Smithers had given him. He knew it would burn through the handcuffs in seconds. And the worst thing was that he could actually feel it, where he had put it, in the zipped upper outer pocket of his combat trousers. But although his outstretched fingers were only a few inches away, try as he might, he couldn't reach it. It was enough to drive him mad. He had heard the, heard the clatter of the helicopter taking off and he knew that Herod Sail must be on his way to London. Alex was still reeling from what he had heard. The multimillionaire was completely insane. What he was planning was beyond belief. A mass murder that would destroy Britain for generations to come. Alex tried to imagine what was about to happen. Tens of thousands of schoolchildren would be sitting in their classes, gathered around their new stormbreakers, waiting for the moment at midday exactly when the Prime Minister would press the button and bring them online. But instead there would be a hiss and a small cloud of deadly smallpox vapour would be released into a crowded room. And minutes later, all over the country, the dying would begin. Alex had to close his mind to the thought. It was too horrible. And yet it was going to happen in just a couple of hours' time. He was the only person who could stop it. And here he was, tied down, unable to move. The door opened. Alex twisted round, expected to see Mr Grin. But it was Nadia Vole who hurried in, closing the door behind her. Her pale round face seemed flushed and her eyes behind the glasses were afraid. She came over to him. Alex, what do you want? Alex recoiled away from her as she leaned over him. Then there was a click, and to his astonishment, his hands came free. She had unlocked the handcuffs. He stood up, wondering what was going on. Listen to me, Vol said. The words were tumbling quickly and softly out of her yellow-painted lips. We don't have much time. I'm here to help you. I worked with your Uncle Hare Rider. Alex stared at him in surprise. Yes, I'm on the same side as you. But nobody told me. It was better for you not to know. But Alex was confused. I saw you with a submarine. You knew what Sale was doing. There was nothing I could do, not then. It's too hard for me to explain. We don't have the time to argue. You want to stop him or no? I need to find a phone. All the phones in the house are coded. You can't use them. But I have a mobile in my office. Then let's go. Alex was suspicious. If Nardi Vole had known so much, why hadn't she tried to stop Sale before? On the other hand, she had released him, and Mr Grimm would be back any minute. He had no choice but to trust her. He followed her out of the room, around the corner, and up a flight of stairs to a landing with a statue of a naked woman, some Greek goddess in the corner. Vole paused for a moment, resting her hand against the statue's arm. What is it? Alex asked. I feel dizzy. You go on, it's the first door on the left. Alex went past her along the landing. Out of the corner of her eye, he saw her press down on the statue's arm. The arm moved. A lever. By the time he knew he'd been tricked, it was too late. 
He yelled out as the floor underneath him swung around on a hidden pivot. He tried to stop himself falling, but there was nothing he could do. He crashed onto his back and slid down through the floor into a plastic into a black plastic tunnel, which corkscrewed beneath him. As he went, he heard Nardia Ville laughing triumphantly. And then he was gone, desperately trying to find hold on the sides, wondering what would be at the end of his fall. Five seconds later, he found out. The corkscrew spat him out. He fell briefly through the air and splashed into cold water. For a moment, he was blinded, fighting for air. Then he rose to the surface and found himself in a huge glass tank filled with water and rocks. That was when he realised, with horror, exactly where he was. Vol had deposited him in the tank with the giant jellyfish. Herod Sales, Portuguese man of war. It was a miracle that he hadn't crashed right into it. He could see it in the far corner of the tank. Its dreadful tentacles were their hundreds of stinking cells twisted and spiralling in the water. There was nothing between him and it. Alex fought back the panic, forced himself to keep still. He realised that thrashing about in the water would only create the current that would bring the creature closer to him. The jellyfish had no eyes. It didn't know he was there. It wouldn't, couldn't attack. But eventually it would reach him. The tank he was in was huge, at least 15 feet deep and 20 or 30 feet long. The glass rose above the level of the water far out of his reach. There was no way he could climb out. Looking down through the water, he could see light. He realised he was looking into the room he had just left. Herod Sale's private office. There was a movement. Everything was vague and distorted through the rippling water. And the door opened. Two figures walked in. Alex could barely make them out. But he knew they were. Fräulein Vol and Mr Grimm. They stood together in the front of the tank. Vol was holding out what looked like a mobile telephone in her hand. I hope you can hear me, Alex. The German woman's voice rang out from a speaker somewhere above his head. I'm sure you have seen by now that there was no way out of the tank. You can tread water, maybe for an hour, maybe for two. Others have lasted for longer. What is the record, Mr Grimm? Uh, five and a half hours, yes. But you'll soon get tired. Alex, you will drown. Or perhaps it'll be faster if you drift into the embrace of our friend. You see him? No? It is not an embrace to be desired. It will kill you. The pain, I think, will be beyond the imagination of a child. It is a pity, Alex Ryder, that M16 chose to send you here. They will not be seeing you again. The voice clicked off. Alex kicked in the water, keeping his head just above the surface, his eyes fixed on the jellyfish. There was another blurred movement on the other side of the glass. Mr Grimm had left the room. But Vol had stayed behind. She wanted to watch him die. Alex looked up. The tank was lit from above by a series of neon strips. They were too high to reach. Beneath him he heard a click and a soft whirring sound. Almost at once he became aware that something was changed, that something had changed. The jellyfish was moving towards him. He could see the translucent cone with its dark mauve tip heading towards him. Underneath the creature, the tentacles slowly danced. He swallowed water and realised he'd opened his mouth to cry out. Vol must have turned on some type of electrical current. It was making the jellyfish move. Desperately, he kicked out with his feet moving away from it, surging through the water on its back. One tentacle floated up and draped over its foot. If he hadn't been wearing sneakers, he would have been stung. Could the stinging cells penetrate his clothes? Almost certainly. The sneakers were the only protection he had. He reached the back corner of the aquarium and posed there, one hand against the glass. He already knew that Vol had said what Vol had said was true. If the jellyfish didn't get him, tiredness would. He had to fight every second to stay afloat. And sheer terror was sapping his strength. The glass, he pushed against it, wondering if he could break it. Perhaps there was a way. 
He checked the distance between himself and the jellyfish, took a deep breath and dived down to the bottom of the pool. He could see Nadia Bell watching. Although she was a blur to him, he would be crystal clear to her. She didn't move and Alex realised with despair that she had expected him to do just this. He swam to the rocks and looked for one small enough to bring to the surface, but the rocks were too heavy. He found one about the right size, just of his own head, but it refused to move. Fowl hadn't tried to stop him because she knew that all the rocks were set in concrete. Alex was running out of breath. He twisted round and pushed himself up towards the surface only seen at the last second that the jellyfish had drifted above him. He screamed. Bubbles erupted from his mouth. The tentacles were right over his head. Alex contorted his body and managed to stay down, flailing madly with his legs to propel himself sideways. His shoulder slammed into the nearest of the rocks and he felt pain shudder through him. Clutching his arm in his hand, he backed into another corner and rose back up, gasping for breath as his head just broke free of the surface of the water. He couldn't break the glass, he couldn't climb out, he couldn't avoid the touch of the jellyfish forever. Although he'd taken all the gadgets Smithers had given him, none of them could help him. And then Alex remembered the zit cream. He let go of his arm and ran his finger up the side of the aquarium. The tank was an engineering marvel. Alex had no idea how much, the, how much water was exerting how sorry, Alex had no idea how much pressure the water was exerting on the huge glass plates, but the whole thing was held together by a framework of iron girders that fitted around the corners on both the inside and the outside of the glass. The metal face is held together by a series of rivets. Treading water, he unzipped his pocket and took out the tube. Zit clean for healthier skin. If Nadia Bell could see what he was doing, she must think he'd gone mad. The jellyfish was drifting towards the back of the aquarium. Alex waited a few moments and then swam forward and dived for a second time. There didn't seem to be very much of the cream given the thickness of the girders and the size of the tank. But Alex remembered the demonstration that Smithers had given him, how little he had used. But would a cream even work underwater? There was no point worrying about that now, he had to give it a try. Alex held the tube against the metal corners of the front of the tank and did his best to squeeze a long line of cream all the way down the length of the metal, using his other hand to rub it around the rivets. He clicked his feet, propelling him across the other side. He didn't know how long it, he would have before the cream took effect and anyway, Nardiva was already aware that something was wrong. Alex saw that she'd stood up again and was speaking into the mobile phone perhaps calling for help. He had used half the tube on one side of the tank. He used the second half on the other. The jellyfish was hovering above him, the tentacles reaching out as if to grab hold of him and stop him. How long had he been underwater? His heart was pounding and what would happen when the metal broke? He had just time to take one breath before he found out. Even underwater, the cream burned through the rivets on the inside of the tank. The glass separated from the girders and there was nothing to hold it back. The huge pressure of water smashed open like a door caught in the wind. Alex didn't see what happened next. He didn't have time to think. The world spun and he was thrown forward as helpless as a cork in a waterfall. The next few seconds were a twisting nightmare of rushing water and exploding glass. Alex didn't dare open his eyes. He felt himself being hurled towards something slammed something slammed into him and then sucked back again he was sure he'd broken every bone in his body now he was underwater he struggled to find air his head broke through the surface but even so when he finally opened his mouth he was amazed he could actually breathe the front of the tank had blown off and a thousand gallons of water had cascaded into herod sales office the water had smashed the furniture and blown the windows out it was still falling in torrents through the holes where the windows had been, the rest of it draining away through the floor. Bruised and dazed, Alex stood up, water curling around his ankles. Where was the jellyfish? He had been lucky that the two of them hadn't become tangled up in the sudden eruption of water, but it still could be close. There might still be enough water in sales office to allow it to reach him. Alex backed into the corner of the room, his whole body taut. Then he saw it. Nardi Vold had been less lucky than he. 
She had been standing in front of the glass when the girders broke and she hadn't been able to get away in time. She was floating on her back, her legs limp and broken. The Portuguese man of war was all over her. Part of it was sitting on her face and she seemed to be staring at him through the quivering mass of jelly. Her yellow lips were drawn back in an endless scream. The tentacles were wrapped all around her, hundreds and hundreds of stinging cells clinging to her arms and legs and chest. Feeling sick, Alex backed away to the door and staggered out into the corridor. An alarm had gone off. He only heard it now as the sound and vision was coming back to him. The screaming of the siren took him out of his dazed state. What time was it? Almost eleven o'clock. At least his watch was still working, but he was in Cornwall at least a five-hour drive from London, and with the alarm sounding, the armed guards and the right razor wire, he'd never make it out of the complex. Find a telephone? No, Bill had probably been telling the truth when she said they were blocked. And anyway, how could he get in touch with Alan Brunt or Mrs Jones at this late stage? They'd already be at the Science Museum. Just one hour left. Outside, over the din of the alarms, Alex heard another sound, the splutter and roar of a propeller. He went out to the nearest window and looked out. Sure enough, the cargo plane that had been there when he arrived was about to take off. Alex was soaking wet, battered and almost exhausted, but he knew what he had to do. He spun round and began to run. Okay, year sixes. Uh, that's the end of chapter 14. Um, I've now got a few questions that I'd like to uh, I'd ask you. Um, I know you've got a copy of these as well, but I'll just run through them with you. Um, I don't know whether you want to sort of whether you're going to answer them now, whether you're going to do them at a later date, but I'll just share them with you um, and, and then you can choose as to whether, as I say, you want to write them now or you're going to go away and find a comfortable place and, uh, and write them there. Okay, so question one. Uh, who comes into the room instead of Mr Grin? Question two. Why does Vel say that she is setting Alex free? Question three. How does Vel trick Alex? Question four. Where does Alex end up? Question five, how does Alex manage to escape? Question six, how does Vel meet her end? And finally, um, if you want to do an extended piece of writing or a short paragraph um, with regards to uh, the next question, that would be great. Um, so the question is, imagine that you are Nordi Vole and you are watching Alex struggle in the tank. Just describe what that must be feel like, what you would be seeing, how you might be feeling. Okay, so thank you very much Year 6. I hope you've enjoyed uh, chapter 14 and that you're looking forward to the next chapter um, and um, I hope that uh, you didn't find the questions too complicated and I, as I said before, I'm looking forward to seeing you in September. Bye!